Hello, good evening. Uh, once again, you're welcome. It's another Tuesday. And it's Talking Health with Dr. Laz, your favorite health program on television. You are watching Africa Independent Television, AIT, and my name is Dr. Laz Eze. Yes, we are in October, and October is another month for cancer awareness. Of course, even though it's a bit more specific for breast cancer, but over the years, every type of cancer gets more awareness. And all cancer advocates, uh, ministries, everybody, you know, utilize this month to create a lot of awareness on cancer. Of course, we are not left out on talking here with Dr. Lars because any health matter is something that is very important to us. So today we are going to be talking with uh, someone who is an advocate, who is a professional, and who is also politically exposed, you know, and who operates both locally and internationally when it comes to cancer space. So, but before we introduce our guest, uh, don't forget to follow us on our social media handles uh, that is well displayed on your screen and ask questions, any good questions you may have, and also make contributions. We will always find time to respond. Yes, today we are going to be explaining what cancer means, how it can be prevented, and also issues around cancer care in Nigeria. Of course, when people hear cancer, it gives different signals. Many families have lost loved ones to cancer. And, you know, uh, WHO, which is World Health Organization, says that 30 to 50% of cancer cases are preventable. Of course, uh, the other ones means we'll do little or nothing to prevent them from happening, but it's well known that when cancer is detected very early and treated promptly, it's, you know, it can be cured and it saves lives. It can, be, it can save any life from cancer, actually. So we'll be speaking with uh, the first lady of KB State, who is a pediatrician and who is also a, a cancer advocate. But that will be right after the break and we'll take you to her office where we're going to have extensive conversation around this topic and we're also going to be signing out from there. Please stay with us and don't forget, ask us questions if you have any. Yes, you are still watching Talking Health with Dr. Lars on Africa Independent Television and I'm with Her Excellency, the First Lady of KB State. Uh, she's also the founder of Medicaid Cancer Foundation and also a board member of the Union of International Cancer Control. In fact, uh, the previous week she was re-elected into the board uh, for the second term, you know, perhaps in recognition of her, uh, the key roles she's been playing. You know, I'm with uh, Her Excellency, Dr. Zina Bagudu Shinkafi. Uh, pleased to meet you, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Dr. Laz. It's nice of to meet you as well. Thank you very much. Uh, you need little or no introduction um, within uh, the health space in the country, given the, a whole lot of roles you've been playing, even before. Uh, you know, uh, you got into political <laughs> exposure to play the role of uh, the uh, wife of the KB state governor. So, but we'll be talking more on the professional uh, aspect in this interview. Uh, October is uh, Cancer Awareness Month, of course, uh, with more focus on breast cancer, but, you know, generally every type of cancer tends to get more uh, awareness and attention around October. Um, and in Nigeria, of course, you and I know that we can spend the entire program talking about the problems and the issues that have to do with cancer. So, but just assume that I'm a layman and uh, kindly explain for the purpose of the viewers uh, what cancer really is, uh, which types of cancers are most common in Nigeria and uh, what we just need to know about the prevention of cancer in this country. Okay, thank you very much for these questions, Dr. Laz. It's a pleasure to meet you always. Um, uh, like you rightly said, uh, the cancer space is something that I have been working in for up to 15 years now. And I got into it, even though you haven't asked me, I will tell you I got into it as a result of the um, need for it. And when I realized the level of education an awareness of people around me in my community was low. They didn't understand what cancer is, so the way they react to it is very different and wrong in a way. Um, 
I'm a pediatrician by training, and so I come across mothers a lot. They come to the hospital with their children, and um, they used to ask a lot of personal questions and relating to the breast especially. So what really is this cancer? Cancer, first of all, we need to realize it can happen in any organ of the body. The body is made up of different organs. If you think of the human body as a building, take a house and you have bricks that make up that house. So the organs, the fixtures in that house are the things that make up the house. So any organ in the human body that is fed with blood can so develop cancer. In simple terms, any part of the body where the blood reaches exactly. can have cancer. Can have cancer. So maybe uh, the I'll hair is exempted. Yes, this is and this is where we always go. The, the nails are exempted and the okay. and the teeth and are the exempted. Teeth. These are the organs that these are the parts of the body that so are any not other parts any other parts. The lungs, the throats, the stomach, mm. the you know, skin the breasts, the prostate, the common ones that we know of. So these are, and this cancer is really just what happens that normally when the cells are dividing, they divide in a systemic way. They, are, they receive signals from the brain and it tells them this is time to grow and then you stop and it sheds and then it keeps growing and it stops and there are different signals that it sends to, that gets sent to the cell. But when cancer happens, it just divides in an irregular and uncontrollable manner. So if you imagine, I usually call it like a bull in a china shop. If you set a bull in a china shop, it just goes rampantly haywire. Scattering everything. Everywhere is scattered. So the, the, the mechanism that controls the cell growth, that is the building block of this house that I described initially, is totally disrupted. And so everything is disrupted and disorganized. And what happens is you now have what we call tumors. These are swellings in the area. It can be the breasts, as we have said, it can be the lungs, it can be the legs, it can be the bones, any part of the body. Sometimes these tumors are what you call benign. That is, it is not harmful. And if you cut it off, that disrupted growth can be stopped or it can even continue growing, but it's not going to kill the person. It is benign. When it is malignant is when it has toxic material inside it and it is actually disrupting, it is stopping the normal processes of the body. So that is the malignant one, and that okay. is the dangerous one, and the type that causes a problem. That is what cancer is. And in the process, I've answered another part of your question, what are the types of cancer? Yes. And the common ones are in, for, in, all over the world actually, breast cancer, cervical cancer, which you see mostly in women, of course, because it's women that have breasts and cervix. However, men also get uh, breast, breast cancer. cancer. Uh, then you have uh, prostate cancer, colon cancer is on the increase now. In uh, temperate countries, uh, that is among Caucasians, white people, you have skin cancer. There's also lung cancer. Uh, and these things, are, all these cancers depend on lifestyle. There is a genetic aspect, but there's also lifestyle. When I say lifestyle, things that we do, things that we eat, habits, do we exercise? Do we eat the right type of food? Smoking, alcohol, these are the kind of lifestyle factors that influence cancer. Okay. Then of course we mentioned sex. If you're a woman, you're more likely to get breast cancer. Age, increasing age, there are some cancers that are more prevalent with age. And then genetics. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in the genes, those controls that I was talking about are inherited can be inherited by, from your genes, from parents and grandparents, or from a lineage, black people versus Caucasians, some are more common, some cancers are more common. Okay. Even some tribes have some certain cancers that are more common in them. 
I'm not going to get into them because in the past yes. I've said it and people <laughs> tend to get, they tend to get uh, upset, but these are scientifically proven facts and research has shown, you know, there are certain ones. And then, of course, you have viruses. Mm -hmm. Cervical cancer has a very high interdependent relationship and uh, occurrence uh, with um, human papilloma virus, HPV virus. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. You know, you kind of really broke it down, even though when it comes to health information, no matter how you try to break it down, you might still find some persons who will be like, oh, this language, I don't quite understand it, but I don't think we can go further than uh, that. But, you know, skin cancer can also affect those living with albinism, and we have a lot of them in, in, this, in, this, in this country. <laughs> Th th thank you so much. Uh, within the oncology space, you, you know, over the past 15 years, you've, you know, have huge experience at every aspect, and the problems are hydra-headed. I don't want us to deep dive into it, but I'll just kind of try to summarize it and now seek your insights on how we can improve on that. For instance, um, we have a problem of not many persons you know, getting to screen themselves to know because you can't know whether you have it or not without screening. And among those who go to screen, many of them get to screen late. So late detection is common. Among those who detect the cancer, majority don't have enough money to fund uh, the, the care or even the some aspects of the diagnosis and treatment. Among those that even the few that have money to get themselves treated, our facilities are not even sufficient for, to, for them to assess care. If you go to National Hospital, you have a very long queue for radiotherapy and the same in many other parts of the country. So where do we start from? <laughs> you know, from the basic identification even for uh, treatment is, is a whole lot of issues. So how do we get to solve? What are your prescriptions? You know, looking at different aspects of our health system from the local to the federal level. Yeah. Okay, so for us, uh, for me, if I give you an example of myself, I explained to you that I got into cancer as a need and as a, you know, it was a calling for me from the requirements of my patients. Mm. And at the time, we were doing it, I was doing it in my center, I was running my pediatric clinic as a form of supporting women and we would have open days, I call them, we used to have open evenings for women. You know, I had just come back from training and I had all these ideas. And we would have open evenings where we would teach them about uh, just awareness, distribute flyers, uh, the kind of symptoms that you get with breast cancer, uh, teach them self-breast examination, because women had an awful amount of questions, particularly in Northern Nigeria. The culture uh, is, kind of hidden and there's a culture of silence around most diseases and most conditions and anything that has to do with the woman's personal body they will bring their children and then the next thing is they're locking the door and oh let me show you something doctor they don't care whether I'm a pediatrician or anything I'm just a woman to them and they ask me this question so we started having these open evenings and then we couldn't cope I couldn't cope with the demand and the need so we set up the Medicaid Cancer Foundation. And the Medicaid Cancer Foundation was set up to take off this pressure from the center to be able to look at the need of these women, to create awareness, to educate them. And then eventually, as they were doing that, what happens? Of course, I, I found a lump. What should I do? So you see, you're coming to the next thing. OK, we're telling them, go for your screening. Go for screening, go early, go early. We're teaching them exactly your question. And yes. more and more, you're getting people that are saying, we're, we're screening and we're finding things. What should I do? Yes. And you tell them, go and do this. But I don't have money. The next problem, funding. Mm -hmm. So you have to deal with that. A lot of foundations, including yours, and many persons have been trying in helping as many patients as they can. But it's still not enough. It's been canvassed in some quarters that a catastrophic health fund, uh, maybe government should put some funds aside to help patients. Some said we should expand a health insurance scheme mm -hmm. and all that. We'll be talking 
more about that after the break you know so we're going to take a break now we get the insight of our excellency you know she has identified many of these uh, but where do we go in terms of helping people to support their care do stay with us and keep making comments on our social media platforms we'll be back we'll be right back Welcome back to Talking Health with Dr. Laz. I'm still with Her Excellency, the First Lady of Kebi State, uh, Dr. Zainab Shinkafi Bagudu. Uh, she's a pediatrician, she's a strong cancer advocate, and she's been doing a lot. So, uh, Your Excellency, we're back. Um, around the solutions to this problem, you know, most of the, many have argued that we tend to focus so much on the federal government, on, you know, making recommendations. Some have argued that the states need to do more. That's where the service delivery is, from the primary healthcare that is now under one roof, and uh, the secondary and tertiary healthcare. So, what could be your recommendation? You've been on every side, you know. So, what could you recommend specifically to us as a people, individuals, to government at various levels, to private sector, in just you know finding support in a number of these challenges? Yeah. Um, I didn't actually finish your, your last question. So it's all about growth and it's all about responding to the need. Yes. And from screening to advocacy for funding to fundraising to advocacy for policy to include the right policies, whether it's at the local government level, at the state level or at the federal level, it involves multi-sectoral approach. It involves our educational system our civil societies, and then of course our government. I always mention government last because like you rightly said, I don't believe that government should be the alpha and omega of these um, issues. Yes, government has a responsibility to set up the right health system, but if you set up the system and people don't go, which is what we are finding, yeah. then of what use is it? Government has a responsibility to set up the right hospitals to equip our hospitals properly. But so does private sector. Private sector can collaborate, can also make those hospitals on their own. And then there's the issue of health insurance. Really and truly, how many of us pay health insurance? So by the time any illness comes, we're not talking about cancer. Cancer is the most expensive disease to treat. It is very complicated and it is very expensive. We treat malaria out of pocket. So how are we going to be able to afford? How many people can afford to treat malaria? Exactly. So how do they afford to treat cancer? It's very difficult if we do not start looking towards health insurance. Yes, there has been a new uh, cry and a new galvanizing. People have galvanized towards health insurance now. But it is only in the formal sector. What happens to our informal sector? That, that comes to uh, my next point. Uh, the, there's this bill at the National Assembly. I think it was passed by the 8th Assembly. It wasn't assented. The Senate had passed it. Perhaps the House is considering it. That is looking at making health insurance mandatory for all Nigerians. Mm -hmm. And looking at people even paying from phone calls or SMS, you know, without knowing that they are even contributing. Mm -hmm. So with that in place, do you think it's something that might provide solution to I catastrophic solution. expenditures? I, I think that we have a better solution that we're already running. Okay. As you are sitting down here, Dr. Laz, how many school fees are you paying? Okay. As you are sitting really, yeah. really and truly, how many people do you contribute to their school fees? How many people do you contribute to their health? I'm sure you have people in your household in your parents' households, back in the village, here in the city or in the village, that you contribute to their health. So we have an altruistic system of giving that is always disco discounted as a people that has not been captured in our, society, in our formal insurance system. Each and every one of us, there is no way Anybody living in my house is going to die of an illness and I'll be watching. Mm. Whatever I have to sell, I will sell. She doesn't have health insurance. She doesn't have anything. She doesn't know how it's going to happen. But, but health insurance so, doesn't want you to sell something. Yes, yes. But then we have to find a way of capturing that. Mm. 
It's an informal way of giving, but it is our way of giving. It's our way of life. If we can get the givers in each society to come together and pull it, it will be difficult. Because even us uh, civil society that fundraise, we find it very difficult to get funding. If we come and say, oh, we're going to fund cancer patients and so on and so forth, it takes us a year to be able to put together the funds that we need to fund maybe 20, 30 patients for cancer. You know, but if it's made more, there's more publicity and more awareness about it, and we know that, yes, you know, we are also partners in this and we are development partners. When we say development partners, people just think about Bill Gates the foreign and <laughs> Bill and Melinda Gates. But we are development partners in our lives. Exactly. We are the major development partners. How much of Bill Gates or any other funding have I seen? So what you're saying is, as a people, we're already showing love to ourselves. We're already yes. giving to support one another. Yes. So we should have a system that will leverage on this lifestyle. We yes, already have, those are the you know, bills that we need. You know, those are the kind of bills that we need. Because, and then the other thing about health insurance is that it can never be equal. Mm -hmm. We talk about universal health coverage, and you look at the, look, if you consider states like Lagos and states like Kebi, for instance, mm -hmm. How is the capture rate going to ever be, or the, 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 the equity that they pay? It's not going to, how many people are working, and then compare, put Kano. Mm. The way they earn, the occupation is different. Lagos is corporate. Mm. Kano, they are traders. Kebi, they are farmers. Mm. So you go and introduce one system fits all health insurance, universal health coverage. Lagos will do well because mm. they go to work, they, they're corporate you know, em, employees. At the end of the month, you can tax them, you can take away from their salary. Uh, the, Lego, the Kano and the Aba traders that are going, they might even be richer than, they're they probably richer than those in Lagos, mm. but they're traveling and moving containers. How do you capture their earnings? Thank you so much. Uh, I, I've been interacting with uh, cancer, a lot of cancer patients, of course, you know, mm -hmm. I've worked uh, considerably in the past couple of years in the cancer space. Mm -hmm. And the survivors uh, trying to get their own insight uh, as what we need to do. One of the things uh, I get strongly is uh, the identify absence of institutional support, which you've talked a, a bit about. Uh, institutional in terms of government, they feel that in many countries, including African countries, uh, people with cancer are not left alone. You know, some their government subsidize their drugs, some they even get it free of charge. Mm -hmm. But cancer patients in Nigeria are just alone. If you don't have any NGO or family or Perhaps some government also intervene in one or two occasions, mm -hmm. so they get to die. Number two, they also feel the frequent strike by health workers. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's no cancer patient or survivor I've talked to that have not mentioned strike action having affected uh, their care yes. one way or the other. They also talked about inadequate capacity. There are some that had misdiagnosis, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that's actually delayed mm -hmm the point that the accurate, appropriate diagnosis mm -hmm. have been made. And, you know, so many others. Mm -hmm. the, 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 there's been suggestions that uh, survivors should be involved at every stage of mm -hmm. policy, implementation, mm -hmm. and all that, perhaps from their inside having experienced this. So what, what are your thoughts around that? I think that um, the world is gradually changing in so many ways. Um, we are going through a pandemic now that is an unprecedented circumstance that none of us could have ever predicted. Uh, the COVID-19, it makes us rethink how we do things. Uh, cancer patients in particular have been terribly affected by it. The treatment was delayed, not just in Nigeria or Africa, but globally. And this is going to bring a lot of mortality and morbidity uh, in the years to come, we're expecting to see a huge amount of deaths following the impact of this COVID uh, lockdown and delay in treatments. Um, inadequate capacity is also something that I agree with. It does happen. And these are all things, issues that if we continue to build the specialty, oncology as a specialty, we can overcome. 
definitely where we are today is not where we were yesterday. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We feel like <laughs> continue this conversation forever, but our time is uh, almost gone. But just uh, lastly, your last words and also bringing into consideration, uh, I would like you to speak to make specific recommendations for bodies like Nigeria Cancer Society, you know, you talked about all of us are part of government, actually, you know, so and that's basically being from UICC where uh, board where you see a lot of things happening in the international space. What are those things that NCS could strengthen itself in, you know, governizing all this advocacy and coordinating a lot of efforts to achieve uh, a better uh, care or access for cancer patients? You just said it, doctor. The Nigerian Cancer Society, strengthen, galvanize. Those are the key words, you know. We need to work together as a group. Strengthen yourself, find the real core advocates, the people that are interested and have a passion, and let them drive it. There's so many areas where we are left behind. Uh, it's not just the Cancer Society. Clinical trials, they don't happen in our country. The academics, the institutions, our higher institutions, there are no adequate trials and research is coming to them. A lot of the drugs that we're using have never been tested on our people. And we go about screaming black lives matter. If black yeah. lives really yeah, don't matter, matter then let us start scientific evidence-based medicine from the black people, if those lives matter. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for Thank making out you. time from your extremely busy schedule. And once again, congratulations on your re-election, deservedly. Our re-election, re yes. <laughs> you know, but you are representing us very well. You are putting thank Nigeria on the global stage you. in the cancer community. So thanks for that. And thank you, our viewers. Uh, we won't be here without you watching. And we thank you once again. My name is Dr. Lazeze. Same time, same station next week, we are still going to be back. But please don't still forget that our social media handles are there for you to ask questions, make comments. Bye for now.